morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the virtual Howard University. I'm Professor Japa Dawuni. I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science here at Howard University, and also the Founding Director of Howard University Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. I'm very excited to be co-hosting this wonderful discussion with my colleague, Dr. Krista Johnson, who is also the Director of the Howard University Center for African Studies. I'm very delighted that we could welcome our colleagues from across the continent to a virtual Howard University. And I really am appreciative to the editors for this book, Dr. Olajumeke Yakob Haliso at Babcock University in, in Nigeria, and Dr. Toyin Falola, Professor Toyin Falola at University of Texas Austin, who might probably be joining us today during this conversation. So I welcome you all to listen, to engage with our colleagues here, and to continue to push forward knowledge production by African women, by women of color, for black women and women of color. So I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Plummer, who is gonna be our excellent moderator for today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Dewoni. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. A special greetings to our panelists, and of course, our students who are on the line today. We're here, of course, to celebrate and engage with the editors and a stellar group of contributors of the Paul Grave Handbook of Women's Studies. This definitive work is the first of its kind to bring together cutting edge theoretical, methodological, and transdisciplinary approaches to the study of African women. However, because we have such a rich cross-section of scholarship from the text in terms of dis the disciplines represented today, this will essentially be a masterclass in African feminist studies and African women's studies. So I'm very honored to introduce the panelists. The first is Dr. Christine Saidi. She's a professor of history at Kutztown University at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Sifokazi Magadla, she's a senior lecturer and the head of political and international studies department at Rhodes University in South Africa. And joining us later will be Dr. Atia Abusiga, who is an associate professor of cultural analysis and gender studies at the University of Development Studies in Tamole, Ghana. We have Dr. Simadele Jose Kuhn. She is an pro assistant professor in media and communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And then Dr. Msia Kabona Clark, who is an assistant professor of African studies at Howard University. The two editors are also joining us. So before I hand it over, we have again, Dr. Olejimuke Jakob Poliso, who is a professor of political science and public administration at Babcock. University in Ogun State, Nigeria, and Dr. Toyan Falola, history, professor of history and university distinguished teaching professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So thanks again, um, Dr. Yakub Haliso, I hand it over to you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Pluma. Um, and um, I want to say a warm welcome to everyone who's taking time to be with us today. Um, and also to say a very big thank you to the Center for Women um, and Global, Women, Gender and Global Leadership, as well as the Center um, for African Studies at Howard University for hosting this uh, virtual launch of the Palgrave Handbook of African Women's Studies. Um, the handbook we, we I also honored to have um, some of our distinguished contributors with us today. Um, thank you so much. We are delighted that you were able to um, attend this event to showcase some of the groundbreaking work that so many African and Africanist scholars brought to the handbook. Um, the handbook of the Paragraph Handbook of African Men Studies um, is a three volume text um, comprising 132 chapters. Um, and contributors from across the African continent, across the United States, across North America, actually, and across Europe. And in fact, we even had an Asian contributor uh, at some point. Um, so this was a truly transnational effort. And basically, I'm often asked, how did this come about? It's simple. We just thought that there are so many handbooks, there are lots of handbooks of women, something women, but there is no handbook of African women's studies. And um, in, in that germinal idea, 
um, a, I, I would say an Iroko tree blossomed, frankly speaking, and out of it came um, the expansion of the, um, of a concept of a text that was supposed to collate and accumulate and advance our understanding of historical and contemporary African women and African women's context. Um, and as we engaged also with fellow feminists, African feminist scholars, the, the idea continued to expand. And that's how the, the handbook that was intended to be 55, 50 chapters and one text ended up being three texts and 132 chapters. And so really we owe it to all the great African feminist scholars who contributed and who some did not contribute, but engaged with us, shared their enthusiasm and basically um, were excited about the ways in which this project was going to advance um, the, the, the frontiers of what we know. There are two editors, but I, I need to say that there were seven section editors who managed the, um, the nine sections that covered various um, aspects. So we also owe them a debt of appreciation for being the first line peer review for all the chapters um, that were submitted. Our objectives ultimately were fourfold um, to expand the meaning, the idea of African women and of Africa, um, wherever it is being read and they are being read, to debunk and continue to debunk the persistent myths and stereotypes about African women and, um, and their context, um, representing stories and story writers, in other words, to be representational, inclusive, and to show a diversity of what it means to be African and to be an African woman, and thereby transform both the field of African women studies and the various disciplines um, from which we study African women. And um, I, I think we'll leave it to our readers to judge um, if we met these objectives, um, but we're so grateful that um, you're hearing about this, here to hear more about this, and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much, um, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to let um, faculty, students, and staff on the call know that the book is available through Howard University Libraries. So if you go to the Howard University Library, you can put in the book title. It's accessible through the Springer Link database. So I encourage you to please download the chapters of the speakers. Um, it's a massive volume, but it is available to um, the Howard community. If you have questions, please use the Q&A button to drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, we will first start off uh, by hearing from each of the authors about the main arguments they made in the chapter, followed by um, a discussion between me and the authors, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So if I, I went through um, by the order of the chapters as they appear in the text. So we're a bit out of order from what's on the flyer, but I think there's a, a beautifully logical flow to how the book was laid out. So we're gonna stick to um, the layout that uh, the editors uh, put in place. So we'll first hear from Dr. Uh, Dose Kuhn. If you could please just share with us uh, your contributions to the text. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Plummer. And thank you, um, to everybody who has made this event happen and certainly to the editors of this magnificent uh, volume, which is so needed, so important, so massive. I mean, I'm in awe of just the sheer scope of it. So thank you so much uh, and, and massive congratulations um, for this work. So I'm just gonna speak briefly about my chapter. So my chapter is entitled Africa. Sorry, Dr. Palmer, how long should I speak for? How about five minutes? It, okay. Five minutes and fewer. <laughs> okay. Okay, so my chapter is entitled African Feminisms, and um, basically the chapter presents a review of African feminist scholarship and debates on what feminism uh, for and by African women comprises, what it's about, what it should be about, what its concerns and priorities should be. Uh, so again, a feminism that sort of that starts from and puts the needs of African women and the conditions and concerns of African women at the center. Um, another way to sort of think about it is that the chapter is really about what the, what the African and African feminisms means, uh, what it implies, how African feminisms are related to, but also distinct from other feminisms. Um, in the very, uh, and, and this, this, is, this has been, or maybe this was a sort of central line of debate in the literature on African feminism, certainly in the early literature. Um, and in the very need for this debate and the very grounds for it, um, 
as well as in the, the arguments and propositions that are put forth in the literature, the politics and the concerns and the motivations are resolutely anti-imperialist. So the concern is to decolonize both feminist knowledge and praxis, um, to reject Western feminist uh, dominance and imperialism and conceits that their feminism is simply feminism and you know, is the feminism for all of us. Uh, I think quite importantly, the move to define and defend African feminisms on our own terms, vis-a-vis -vis Western feminisms, is also to, to speak back to or to push back against claims in the African context by anti-feminist actors of various sorts, that feminism in that context is um, illegitimate is a cultural import, is inauthentic, and so on and so forth. So that's really the sort of the, the, the grounds of the discussion in the chapter. And basically what the chapter does is review the different, different positions and different propositions that have been made about, again, what, the, what African feminisms are uh, or, and what they should be. Um, I argue in the chapter, and I, I mean, I hope it comes through in the discussion that, you know, there, there are various kinds of ideas um, that, there's a certain kind of strand of essentialism, particularly in the earlier um, earlier literature from, from the 80s and maybe early 90s, uh, that's concerned with, again, with, with sort of defining Africanness um, in arguably essentialist terms to, to sort of set up difference, to set up and defend and also celebrate difference from the West. Uh, I would suggest that more recently, the literature has moved to what in the chapter I call a more pragmatic kind of considerations and thinking about what what the African and African feminisms uh, refers to, thinking of that much more in terms of um, Africa as the kind of the contextual and conjunctural grounds of African feminism, not so much the, the, the blood of African feminism, as it were. And I argue in that chapter, uh, and you know, very much echoing uh, arguments in the literature that I argue against even what, what I call in the chapter, even weekly essentialist um, ideas of African feminisms or of Africanness. Um, for many reasons, but above all, because in the different kinds of formulations that we see and that we have, they end up excluding uh, African women of different types. Because so for instance, uh, you know, some of the claims in the literature, particularly again, the earlier kind of literature, you find claims like things like um, lesbianism is not African. So therefore, you know, lesbian sexuality is not an African feminist concern, for example. And so therefore, you know, certain kinds of African women get excluded. There are also claims in, in that early literature about uh, the, the centrality, the normative centrality of motherhood, let's say, to African, to African women's identities, to African women's lives, to, the, to African women's value, and therefore to African feminisms, which again end up um, inadvertently or not being exclusionary and being problematic and really be inscribing certain kind of power relations within Africa and within Africanness. So overall, I argue in that chapter uh, um, that, you know, the, the move to decolonize African feminisms, of course, it's, it's very important, and, but that it's, 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 it's complex and it's much more than simply rejecting Western feminisms that we have to also be critically reflexive about and attuned to and committed to, um, to not be inscribing difference and exclusion within Africa of different sorts. So I, I think I'll leave it there, but that's my chapter in a very, very quick <laughs> nutshell. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. So we'll move on now to uh, Dr. Magadla. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plama. I'm also very happy to be here to be part of this um, very important achievement by Professor Jakob Haliso and Falola. My chapter is called Theorizing African Women and Girls in Combat from National Liberation to the War on Terror. My fascination here was to think through some of the ruptures and continuities in how we think about the participation of African women and girls in different kinds of combat over time. And one of the things I was fascinated about is the idea which is very big in feminist international relations about where war happens, the spaces where war happens. So one of the books that has contributed to a big debate is you know, Mero Caldo's work on her uh, categorization of so-called old wars and new wars, where she says by the, old, by the end of the 18th century, there were different spaces where we could say, this is where war happens, a home front, a battlefront, and there are people that are combatants and others that are civilians. But my sense is that if we take Africa's experience of invasion, of colonialism, we see um, that those categories don't stand. They 
they are one, they are gendered, those categories are based on gender, but also they don't stand in that for Africans, the war is at home as feminists have proclaimed. So if one takes our own experience of how African women and girls have contributed in national liberation, in the wars that take place after the Cold War, the ones that are called rebels and bushwives, and now that um, the women and girls that are part of Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab, my sense is that they show us um, that there is no distinct space where war happens. There is a blurring of these spaces. And in many ways, the war in Ukraine shows us exactly that, that the war happens at home. And of course, Honwana's work shows us that, that child soldiers strip those ideas that are very uh, close and dear to international relations scholars about combat and battlefront and home front. But the other um, thing I was interested in are these hierarchies that we have. So the women that we call guerrillas or guerrilla girls, the ones that were um, part of the national liberation movements, such as Umkondo and Sizwe in South Africa, who were trained by the Soviet Union, by the Cubans. Um, you know, those ones, we hold those women as, as, as forming uh, the top of the hierarchy in terms of women's achievement and ability to prove that they can participate in combat equally as men. But my sense is that those hierarchies are actually false. And so we see in the literature that comes of how women and girls participate in Sierra Leone, in Northern Uganda, in Liberia, we see that they complicate um, those ideas again of what is combat um, as well that we see that what unites the continuum rather between the, the ones that were trained as well as the ones that participate in wars in the 1990s is that uh, women are still questioned whether or not they really participated in combat. So they, they can get trained similar to men, they can prove themselves in terms of training, but there remains a question whether you are Joyce Moduru in Zimbabwe or you are women who are part of the ANC in South Africa. It remains a question whether or not you really participated in combat. We see the same in the kinds of intelligence work, underground work that is done by women in Boko Haram and Al Shabaab, that there's a questioning of whether or not they are participating in the real war effort. And yet, the place in which the violence happens is in the homes, is in the private spaces. So that's the, the other key point for me. But it also reminds me of that work of people like Cynthia Emler who said, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't venerate the trained women. So the woman soldier um, is more important than the uh, military wife or the sex worker. In terms of the war effort, all of these women are vital to the war effort. So that's what I tried to show that there's more continuity between the women that participated in national liberation, what we see in the 1990s, as well as what we see in the turn of the century um, during um, with this war of uh, on terror. Then maybe lastly, I'm also I was also fascinated by the appearance of childhood in how we think about combat. So there's one thing is that colon um, under colonialism. Africans are just children. Whether they are 80 years old or 60 years old, 60 years, they are garden boys and garden girls and tea girls. So that's how childhood appears. But then the other part is that what motivates many of the women who participated in national liberation was to fight to claim childhood. You know, one of the poems I love from the generation of 1976, the poem that says, there is no childhood in Soweto. So the fight for childhood appears in that way as a motivator to participate in combat. So there's a silence about whether or not women participated as children in combat, um, or rather the absence of childhood motivated them to participate in combat. Then at the, in the 1990s, what we see happening in Northern Uganda and Sierra Leone is that children participate primarily as children. So you are recruited because you are nine years old, you are 14 years old, because you are a child who can be dragged, who can be raped to participate in combat. So I was also curious about those ways. But ultimately, I think I'm running out of time. I think the denial of women and girls' contributions in combat, we see it in that women in the, after the war, you know, they are not 
are glorified um, as the men. But also we see that in the absence of women's claim to public power and governance, it is how we fight the war um, that then shapes how women are remembered um, in the aftermath. And I see much more continuity um, where the women prove themselves to, uh, uh, to be able to do what men are, are, are also able to do, but that doesn't guarantee respect or heroism in the aftermath. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Dr. Saidi? Hi. Um, well, I actually wrote three chapters, two on my own and one with my two colleagues, um, Dr. Rhonda Gonzalez and Dr. Simone Forche. And I feel it's been a real honor to be included both in the book and in this panel. I'm a historian of early African history, particularly Bantu social history. So I'm kind of coming from another part of the continent. Um, and in my histories, I started with the origin of human beings. The first woman, first person was an African and we need to start when we look at the history from that perspective. And then I tried to put together as many sources as I could find about various women, but I don't wanna do the heroine kind of idea because the more I study, especially in terms of the social history of Bantu speaking people, that women as mothers, excuse that, but and sisters and grandmothers have played crucial roles within the society and often being the import, most important roles within society. So we don't just need to look for the heroines. I mean, in the West, they had Queen Victoria or whatever. But in fact, in Africa, women have played a central role for a very long time in history. And I think it's something that's really left out of a lot of any world history books, anything. And I think it's time we put this history back in. And the third um, chapter is maybe the more controversial one. This is where we're, we're kind of going with our research. And um, in Bantu speaking Africa, we're proposing there is no binary gender historically. That in fact, there's no word or category for woman or man. There's life stages, there's other sorts of things, but in fact, there are no categories. And in, a, in, a, in the West where binary gender is everywhere, deconstructing, constructing, whatever, um, it's really important to understand that a whole lot of people in Africa did not construct societies based on binary gender. And my really good friend, Ronke Oyewumi said this to me years ago, about Yoruba society, and I go, yeah, but can that be true about Bantu-speaking society? But we were able to do a huge, we got a grant, we were able to do this huge um, database, really looking at vocabulary from all of Bantu-speaking Africa, from Angola to Mozambique and places in between and south. And it really, you start to see this whole idea of, um, gender not being a very important category. And different centers of power in early African history. And of course, we have to look at colonialism and all, because they destroyed it, all kinds of stuff. But the point is not just um, talking about new ways to do history, but it's time the people in the rest of the world started to understand what African history and society and social institutions can teach them. And I think this is a, a point that's really crucial that for so long, it feels like all we do is, at least I'm speaking for African history, you gotta keep showing people, well, no, African women weren't oppressed by African men or African tradition back in the day. And, but now it's time to say, look, they created institutions where people are able to live in a very good kind of way and imagine a world without binary gender. Trust me, it's hard. I'm, we're working on a book right now and trying to write to people who have binary gender, uh, create a society, make them think about the fact, what if that's taken away? How do you look at the world? That's sort of what it well enough. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Gabona Clark. <laughs> 
Thank you. So, um, the title of my chapter, uh, is African women, hip hop artists representing transnational identities. Uh, your friend me rebel is the sub sub heading of that title. So, uh, the chapter really was kind of grown out of previous work I had done on African women, hip hop artists on the specifically on the continent and looking at how their work uh, was kind of an example of African feminism, um, just kind of on a different platform and how their work contributes to African feminist thought. And a lot of it really comes out of the cultural studies idea that cultural representations like music can kind of construct narratives for us, that they provide information on numerous things, but how we identify, how we see other people, um, they provide narratives uh, for people who may not know certain, you know, are not familiar with, or narratives that challenge the dominant perceptions of specifically in this case, African women. So, you know, through that became, I became aware of some of the artists that were in, specifically in Australia and the UK. There aren't very many women um, from Africa that are active in hip hop in the US. They're just, they're just numerically, they're just more in, in uh, the UK and in Australia, France, I'm sure there are many, but my French was not up to par. I was not able to analyze um, any Francophone music. And so I wanted to look at how these women in the diaspora through music contributed to narratives around African women's experiences. And so, you know, I also kind of wanted to look at it through multiple lenses. Um, so looking at African feminist, the African feminist lens, um, but then also really looking at hip hop feminism, which also has a lot of parallels. And so it was interesting because their experiences were different and from, from, you know, traditional hip hop feminism, which is rooted in African American women's experiences, their experiences because of the hip hop element there were things that were not necessarily shared with kind of traditional African feminist thought. So I was careful not to create a new term. Um, I feel like we have a lot, hip hop feminism, transformative feminism, black feminism, African feminism, Africana. I mean, there's just all of these terms and, and none perfectly fit, but I'm not, I don't want to create a new term, but I do want to explore how these women differed in terms of, you know, their experiences and how those experiences were articulated. I wanted to look at how they had identified differently and how their kind of transnational identities. So a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of um, conversations happened around the idea of kind of, you know, transcultural identities based on like the, the increased mobility of people of African descent. People are, you know, living and moving throughout the world. And so it's no longer, you know, you're born and raised here, you go to school here, you go back or you stay, but it's just those two countries as your primary references. Now you have people moving around and you have multiple countries that they're, you know, having lived experiences in. So I wanted to um, look at how their identities were different how their experiences were different and how those shaped the content of their music, especially when you're comparing it to what women on the continent are producing. And so what my article found or research found was that the artists in the diaspora presented more diverse representations of gender, of sexuality and spirituality. So I wasn't I wasn't as surprised about sexuality and interviewing a couple of artists previously. The they felt that yes, there were social constraints. They felt you know that, that they did not want to go beyond in terms of um, how they dress or the content, the explicit content in their lyrics. But they recognize that they had more liberty to talk about certain things or behave in a certain way in terms of sexuality. So one of the, the comparisons or one of the conversations that I had frequently, especially with Ghanaian artists, was the case of Ms. Bell, um, who was an artist who was criticized for dressing too provocatively. And, um, you know, uh, she was a Ghanaian based, Ghana based Ghanaian artist. And so uh, she was um, assaulted, sexually assaulted in her home um, by a group of men. And the conversation around that assault was, well, you know, this is how she, she, she deserved it. She dressed this way. This is what happens. 
And, uh, and you know, she has gone on, Ms. Bell has gone on to move to gospel music. So she's no longer doing popular music. She's gone on to gospel music. And some of the artists were, you know, in Ghana felt that respecting her decision, but also kind of felt that um, it shows that this form of policing women's bodies or this form of kind of punishment for us stepping outside of what we're our, you know, traditional roles or what we're supposed to do um, was justified. And so this is, you know, an acceptable form of punishment um, of, as a way of policing women. Some of the Ghanaian women artists outside of Ghana recognize that they were not necessarily in physical danger um, and were able to talk about certain things um, in spaces that perhaps their counterparts on in Ghana were not. Spirituality, um, very similar thing. You know, um, you have a lot of artists on the continent who do bring spirituality into their music, but in the diaspora, it was more elements of, you know, not just traditional African religion or Christianity or Islam, but they were bringing in, you know, Asian religious uh, thoughts and beliefs. And they were bringing in, you know, kind of mixing them and saying that, you know, they were pulling from elements of, you know, multiple religious systems and in ways that exploring spirituality in ways that wasn't just wasn't happening that much on the continent. So I thought that that was interesting. Uh, and then I also wanted to look at their identities. I knew that, you know, their, because some of them were individuals who were born on the continent, left when they were young. Some of them were a little bit older when they left, and some were born on um, in the diaspora to African parents. And so their identities kind of came into their music in various interesting ways. Some of them did invite artists on their projects to perform in specific African languages. Some of them made references. And it's interesting because this was written um, a, a while ago, but just this past summer, there were three uh, women, I think they're all Nigerian and Nigerian British, um, that all released projects this past summer. And all of them are, you know, you, there's an increased content that kind of deals with the being British and being Nigerian and being far removed from, from Nigerian culture, but wanting to hang on to that culture and wanting to kind of have that connection, but being raised in this environment. So it's, it's, I kind of wish that these albums had come out prior to me writing this article, but, um, just really interesting look at how the concept of identity or the idea of identity and how people identify um, there are more discussions of migration as well as race and racism, especially Australia, where the African migration um, uh, experience is newer. So Africans have been migrating to Australia fairly recently when you compare it to the UK. And so there have been more incidents of racial violence and tensions in, in Australia. And this kind of um, was heard in the music of the artists more so than in the music of the UK artists. So all of that was, you know, kind of really what the, the chapter was about and um, what I was trying to, to explore. Thank you so much. So um, again, for members of the audience, if you have a question, please, we prefer for you to use the Q&A um, tab because it's a bit hard pulling the questions out of the chat box. There are a few questions in the chat box that uh, we'll try to keep track of. Um, thank you so much for your very concise summaries of very complex chapters. As I read your chapters, the highlighter, I mean, it was mostly green. There were very few empty spots because the language that and concepts were just so powerful, powerful for each of you. So kudos for writing very densely theoretical chapters with very concrete examples in a way that I think is accessible, even to folks who may have never taken a women's studies class before. So the depth is not compromised whatsoever in terms of the content of the chapters. So we're talking about decolonizing African feminisms, right? We're talking about decolonizing women's studies. So in terms of threads that connect each of your chapters, one, you all really do a deep dive into the existing literature. So that's why, you know, these chapters, just this cross section of chapters is really a masterclass in international relations, cultural studies, history, um, women's studies. 
So the deep dive that you all do into existing literature, I think is very important for understanding the evolution, the disjunctures, the connections um, that exist in each of your topics. You all also respectively, you know, challenge historical assumptions. You challenge cultural essentialism. You look at feminism in practice, right? So with that, um, I'll begin, uh, if it's okay with Dr. Dose Kuhn, with a question. I noted um, feminisms plural. And in your chapter, you really um, anticipate some of the counter arguments. <laughs> um, you anticipate some of the challenges that, you know, folks who may not understand how complex African feminism is, but some of the controversies that exist, you really react or you respond to each of those. So if you can talk about the discursive aspects of feminism, the language that we use, the word feminist, is it Western? You, you talk about womanism, motherism. So there's the discursive aspect in terms of the language that we use, and then more importantly, the concepts behind it. And you know, what does it actually mean? Why does it matter in terms of the everyday lives of women? So it doesn't just exist in ether. <laughs> um, will you please talk about that, um, this plurality and um, why you felt like you had to address it in this chapter? Okay, thank you. Well, firstly, I had to address it because I was told to. That was the brief <laughs> from the editors. I, I'm just joking. I mean, it was the brief, but I mean, of course, it was. It's important and necessary. Uh, I mean, I think. I think in the first place, I would say that um, really, what the chapter is trying to do, and which you know, the literature, which is evident in the literature, is to is to map the the debates. You know, so so part of the need to pluralize African feminisms is to recognize that firstly, well, two things. Firstly, that African women are not singular um, as a category, of course. But of course, they often do get represented and imagined in those terms, uh, particularly from outside the continent, but even sometimes within the continent in terms of you know, certain mobilizations of that discursive and obviously highly moralized category of, of African women. So that's one thing is to, you know, the, the pluralizing is, is a recognition of the of the plurality of the subjects of concern, but then also of the of the views and positions and arguments in the literature. You know, so so again, there's a lot of, particularly in the early literature, as I said already, in the eight, the literature in the eighties, there was a lot of uh, disagreement. Maybe disagreement maybe is a bit strong, but you know, diff, just different points of view as to what are we talking about, uh, what should we name it. So I didn't I didn't speak to the I didn't uh, mention the question about naming when I first spoke, and I saw that there was a question in the chat about that is there, is it not a is it not still reinscribing Western dominance to even be talking using the language of feminism, that if it's a Western concept and, and word? So that is a debate in the literature as well. But, you know, should we be, should African women even be calling themselves feminists? Do we need to come up with our own different terms, variously indigenous, or in some cases, uh, drawing on Black African-American kind of uh, discursive um, uh, concepts and categories, you know, trying to make a certain, make certain claims and links about Blackness? Uh, and black feminism. So, so that's a debate in the literature as well. Um, the, the other thing, and this is a, a newer sort of strain of concern in, in, in the scholarship, but also very much on the ground in, in practice, as well as this newer concept of women's empowerment and the ways in which that kind of discursive category um, is mobilized, uh, and used in the African context, very much sort of linked to the context of development and you know to the praxis of development um, in ways that, so women's empowerment, obviously women's rights and so on, in ways that um, variously seek to sort of distinguish and possibly delegitimate feminism. So the idea that, you know, that, that thing of, I, 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 you know, that one might say that I, I support or I believe in or I even work for women's empowerment, but it's not feminism. So all those things are, are in the literature and I think in practice as well, all those kinds of um, questions about naming are there. But as I said briefly, I do think most recently and certainly contemporarily, I do think that there's a kind of a, a return to or an acceptance of the term feminism and, and their arguments that are made. And certainly I would make this argument myself and in my own work, I mean, I do work with a name and term feminism that the argument about rather than rather than um rejecting these terms outright rather 
reclaiming them and making them our own and defining them and defining them for ourselves including so that we can be in conversation with other feminisms because again it's not about sort of turning our back on everything and being so insular you know we want to define our own terms ourselves but we also are hopefully or should be involved in in kind of global conversations as well about women's issues and women's rights and feminism so. in the chapter you know that it's theorizing from the ground up right instead of it existing above that you know in terms of how we deploy use these terms conceptualize them and then deploy them whether it's within uh, a women's agency or women's empowerment uh, context that there are very concrete ways in which they can be used in the real world um, I, I just want to note um, that explicitly, you know, the question is answered in the chapter. So I'm plugging reading the chapter, um, the word feminism, you know, unpacking the term feminism in some of the debates. So you're very humble. So I just want to let folks know that um, you say it's in the literature, it's in your chapter, <laughs> everything. All yeah, but can I just say one quick other thing? I mean, it's still the same point, but I, I mean, again, it's this thing where I just, I, I think that I guess I'm so I'm so wary of and skeptical about essentialism and, and nativism as a response to imperialism. I just think, and, and it's and I mean we see similar things in, in blackness as well. You know, sort of the, the kind of in in a in black um a certain kind of black nationalism. And and in a way, I would argue that if we retreat into nativism in response to imperialism, we're still in an imperial bind, actually. I would argue it's just not good enough and particularly if it inscribes violence on some of us in the process you know so saying people are not african enough or people are not black enough or if you're a lesbian then sorry you don't we got nothing for you know you're not part of our constituents constituency so i uh, you know i my argument i don't know how we do it in practice but it's how do we i think we have to balance the anti-imperialism and the rejection of white supremacy with as i try to say critical interrogation of what we are doing ourselves. Not just saying, well, this is the pre-colonial, so therefore it's better and fetishizing that, you know? It's, I just think it's much more complex. Absolutely. And you mentioned cultural conservatism with essentialism, that these concepts that say, oh, feminism is a Western import that's layered on how conservative, you know, cultures, essentializing African culture can be linked to, to, you know, having conservative ideas and you bring up feminism and sexuality as one example that, you know, I hope we get to in this discussion. Um, but moving on to Dr. Magala, um, you really did an outstanding job intersecting feminism and international relations. And you provide that mapping. I like that Dr. Dosa Kuhn mentioned, said mapping of how feminine relate, uh, feminism and women's studies works in international relations through war, you know, how war is studied. Will you talk, because I think it, it's almost as a given, you know, on my end, will you talk about the transition for just recognizing the role of women in conflict and also including girls. Why wasn't it a given and why is it significant? Um, and you bring up cases related, very contemporary cases related to the war on terrorism um, and how women and girls have played a very particular role um, internally in Africa, but also it's linked to US policy in Africa. So will you, will you address those two points? Thank you so much. Um, so maybe let me start with the with the second one, the sort of the recognition recognition of women and girls. And one of the things that um, Nordstrom talks about is how, you know, um, in the eighties there's the question of you know where are the women? Um, uh, Yolanda Bukka poses this question as well in her chapter in this handbook. Um, but then she says, but I was looking for girls. I could see women. You know, when I was in Mozambique, I could see women. But where where, where were the girls? And this is, you know, for us in a society where if a woman talks about seniority, the journey from girlhood to womanhood is a real thing, you know. Um, and so there is a place for a girl in an African society. So why would they be missing in a, in a, in a context of, uh, of war? And I sometimes think in my own work on women in the armed struggle in South Africa, that of course the, 
girls that become women, you know, who join these um, these guerrilla, um, these yes, these, these uh, liberation movements. You know, these are girls that come from a society where a key definition of what it means to be a good girl is to be industrious in the ways in which Amaiduma evokes. That continues, and I agree with you know uh, Simi Dele's um, chapter that we don't need, we don't need to evoke Amaidume or Oyewumi in ways that essentialize our, their work. I think it is to be anti-intellectual to do that. But we can pick up how it would make sense for the girl child who grows up um, where a key definition of what it would be to be a successful woman is defined by provision, economic and otherwise, you know, it, it becomes thinkable for them to take political action. So that's one point. Um, and then the other part for me is that it is because of African women's mobilization that we get the language of women, peace and security, right? UN 1325 is very much informed by the experience of women and girls in Africa um, who said we need to recognize the various ways in which they are, um, you know, they, they become victims of the war, but the ways in which they contribute to the war effort. So for me, what was striking, and we had a, a back and forth with uh, Prof. Jakub Haliso about this, is that in a way, sometimes the way uh, an organization like Boko Haram then uses girls in the war on terror is almost to turn that on its head. So now we have a language for girls that gets the world in action, that gets Michelle Obama to be interested uh, in what happens to little girls in Nigeria. So they know that, um, you know, Cheryl Hendricks made this point that weeks before the abduction um, of, the, of the girls in, 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 in Nigeria, there had been boys that had been burnt to death in a school and no one made a noise about it. So the successful feminist mobilization that gives us the language of women and security, these uh, armed non-state actors and state actors, they're able to use it for their own purposes, useful for their own uh, effort. Uh, which is why then, you know, Boko Haram uses girls as suicide bombers. And there I try to engage whether or not we can say they are agents if they are nine years old. What kind of consent is that if you're talking about a child? And I usually have a big concern when we speak in broad categories, you know, of the women who are in their 30s to a nine-year-old. I think it, it is important to, to, to talk about them as a woman and uh, as, as a girl, even though there, of course there are many, there are some parallels in their own um, experience. Um, so that's my fascination with how the language of women in peace and security, um, which makes women's participation in peacekeeping, in war, and the, in, in its prevention both thinkable and desirable, can in turn actually be turned on its head. I can't remember the, the first question that you asked, sorry. No, I actually think you addressed both questions. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you oh, sorry, the last thing I had wanted to say, um, Simi Dele, I think quotes Amina Mama or Lewis to say we must claim feminism because it makes these, um, uh, these men so fearful, that it makes them so fearful is exactly why we should continue to use it, to claim it. Thanks. Right on. So, um, well, connecting to life stages, Dr. Sahidi, your work, um, I think um, Dr. Magatla really opened it up for you um, and your just very groundbreaking work. Will you please explain the idea of um, gender and heterarchy as another way of understanding or explaining why gender was not I don't, I'm, I want to make sure I'm saying this correctly. Gender, concepts of gender as we understand it aren't necessarily applicable to, um, um, because I read all three of your chapters, so things are starting to run together. I apologize. <laughs> applicable to um, Bantu speaking groups and their conceptualizations of gender. Well, I mean, one thing I first want to say is somebody who does early African history people that claim this is the pre-colonial past haven't really done the history. And we have a lot more still to do. I just want to clarify that because um, 
I, it, it sounds dangerously like, I remember when I wrote my first article, they go, oh, you're romanticizing Africa. Because you find very important and good institutions in Africa. And two thirds of sub-Saharan Africa are Bantu speaking peoples. And we were able to look um, through historical linguistics, um, oral tradition, comparative ethnography, because there's no written records per se, songs, proverbs, poems. And you start to see this idea of gender being fluid and not actually determining status. And this is where heterarchy comes in, is you have institutions set up that one group has power here, one group has power here, one group has power here, and one group has power, I'm oversimplifying it, on this sort of like vertical. And you create a, institutions to try and stop one group from dominating. And that's kind of a world view of heterarchy. And more and more, if you look at the early history, but you don't even have to look at the early history, go out to rural villages in Zambia or Mozambique or in the matrilineal zone, and you're gonna find these ideas are alive and well still. And I think it's really important to accept patriarchy was an import. And this idea that somehow, I mean, look at Enzegu's work about the invention of tradition. I think we could find, find throughout all of Africa that they invented this patriarchal tradition and then said, hey, this is what it is. And men were really happy to get into it, but it isn't real. Growing up in the West, I'm an American, of course. I grew up with this idea of we're male or female, and then gender gets kind of mushed between both physical and social. But I see the world in that way. Go to um, any part of Bantu speaking Africa, and you'll find, I know you find this in West Africa too, you find, you know, female husbands, which I'd actually say are female fathers. In the matrilineal belt, you find um, male mothers. The Chitikumulu, who's the leader of the Bimba, when he is coronated, he is physically male, but he has to become a mother. These kinds of constant fluid traditions going on. And what they really speak to, I think, is that we have really made some serious mistakes, including my work, of assuming that binary gender is universal. It's not. And I think a lot of the work looking at Bantu speaking Africa is going to be able to show that. I mean, we've gone through, um, we have a database of over 70 Bantu speaking languages and words that talk about social institutions and family. And there's a whole lot of sort of new things we're heading into. And I think, and my point isn't to, okay, romanticize Africa, but I mean, heterarchy, non binary gender. Those are things that are pretty important institutions. And I think it's important that people understand that these, these, this role that African, Africans have played in the pre-colonial period, even today, when you go out, like I say, go out to the rural villages and you're gonna see it. Um, I'll give you one example and I'll shut up. <laughs> I, um, I went to the United Church, Methodist Church of Zambia with a, a good friend of mine to talk about my book that talked about how powerful Bimba, older Bimba women were. And we're leaving, and there were two choirs. One had a choir, they all wore nice blue robes, which is the color of the United Church of Zambia. And they're all ages and male, female. And then there was this choir of older women in red, white, and black in this separate part. As we left, they grabbed us and said, come to choir practice on Wednesday. We went to choir practice on Wednesday and they loved Jesus, but man, they remembered all the female initiation dances and songs and practiced them. And so on the surface, it looked like, okay, one thing's going on, but underneath so many other things are going on. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I know what I'm putting out there is 
considered radical by a lot of people. But I think we have to start thinking about this deep history because if anything, African people are into history, the original historians, oral tradition, all of that. I guess I. <laughs> Great, thank you. So um, again, if the audience has questions, please drop your questions in the Q&A. We, we have quite a backlog that I'll get to in a second. Um, but before I open it up to the Q&A from the audience, um, Dr. Clark, your chapter was just so enlightening. Again, you know, masterclass in um, the use of hip hop as a musical form and engaging politics, identity, uh, migration. Um, so my question is, you know, for this chapter, you focus specifically on artists from Europe and Australia. Was there anything unique in terms of their social commentary that they were talking about? Um, and, you know, is there anything unique in terms of their male counterparts, in terms of counterparts, you know, in Africa and North America? Was there something there, any threads that you thought were particularly, you know, um, noteworthy? And then also in your chapter, you talk about the complexities that these hip hop artists deal with. It's like layered issues um, that they unpack. Um, in your view, how are they conveying feminist ideas? Like you actually talk about this in the chapter, but I, I mean, specifically, if you can share with us, you know, what, how is hip hop as a musical form decolonizing feminism in a very particular way? Well, thank you for that. I mean, in terms of looking at their differences with male artists and, you know, well, there are more, there are more men that are active in hip hop period. Um, but when it comes to Africans involved in, in the genre, there, you know, also are more men that are active. I would say that women's voices are increasing. Um, so there are more and more women who are releasing projects, who are getting involved. Um, you know, hip hop culture is known for its misogyny, is known for kind of this promoting this kind of hyper masculine aggressiveness. And so the way women are navigating that, some of them are, you know, utilizing hip hop braggadocio, which, you know, is this idea that you brag about yourself, your style, your lyricism, your skills. And one of the things that that does for women artists is that it pretty much helps establish their um, right to be in this very masculine space, this very um, misogynist misogynistic space and on their own terms. And so you, you find that many of the artists, um, don't, you know, reject the term, you know, female rapper or some of the other terms that qualify the type of artist they are. They're, they're an artist and want to be seen on par with their male counterparts. Uh, so you do see that that is something that they're very conscious of. They're also very conscious of however they are representing themselves in terms of their sexuality and gender. So it's if whether they choose to censor their sexuality or not, it is still something that they have to think about, something they have to consider. It's something that they have to decide, you know, um, how am I going to represent myself as an African woman? Um so you are seeing that difference with, whereas, you know, there are a lot of their male counterparts, how they represent their sexuality is not quite at the forefront of their, of, you know, of their music. And I will say that many of the African male artists, specifically the ones that, that left the continent, um, high school, you know, for college. So artists like Blitz the Ambassador from Ghana, um, are more socially and politically conscious than the ones who say are born here who've never been to the continent. So you have an artist like Doja Cat, who, <laughs> whose father is South African. It features nowhere in her music, and it's not something that is a part of you know her brand. Um, but then you've got other artists that are very clearly wanting to represent this dual identity, this transcultural identity, this transnational identity. So I definitely think you have that. And in terms of, um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of using hip hop studies as 
really a model for how I look at African experiences in the culture, but then also using hip hop studies methods um, to contribute to the decolonizing agenda. So when we talk about decolonizing African studies, Africans, we know the history of African studies. I don't have to kind of go through the history of that, but hip hop studies as a, as a field, as a, as, you know, has its own kind of methodologies and own approaches to research because the field as an the academic st field of study came from the individuals who were involved in the culture. They were very aware of um, racism in academia, of the problems in other disciplines, especially the major disciplines. And so it, from its very beginning, was already kind of, had already gone through, you know, decided they were not going to bring in those elements. Um, so the methodology is definitely different. So the way I approached it, um, there's more collaborative engagement with the artists. The artists are in, in many ways partners with you in your research as you're seeking to analyze what the lyrics mean. And sometimes that means having a conversation with the artist um, after you've kind of done your analysis. Uh, hip hop studies is really, you know, abolishing the hierarchy between the researcher and the communities that they're working in. So hip hop studies is not the only era, area that does that, but I found it very helpful. The whole conversation around consent forms. We know consent forms can be violent in many ways. I mean, our people have a history of signing forms and then their land being taken away. And so you have these forms that have very complicated language. Uh, so how then do you get consent and kind of create a working relationship without kind of bringing in that colonizing aspect? And so hip hop studies, I really was able to utilize that uh, as I was doing the, the research. Thank you so much. So um, if the panelists can begin to look at the questions in the Q&A, we're going to go there and I'm going to choose a few. I just want to reiterate that the title of the book is The Paul Grave Handbook of, Women, of African Women's Studies. People in the Howard University community can access it through the Howard University Library website online. And a link has been dropped um, in the chat box. So you all can download the chapters of the speakers. We've also been joined by the other editor of the handbook, uh, Dr. Toyin Falola. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> so we have uh, some questions. Hi, how are you? Did you want to say a few words? That's fine. I'm enjoying the conversation. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you so much for joining us. So we have um, questions live from Dr. Dawuni's class. Dr. Dawuni, is your are your students um, ready to ask their questions live now? Yeah. Yes. Let me do my magic with two microphones. All right. So thank you. So once again, thank you to the editors and thank you to our wonderful um, artists for giving us such. Can you hear me? Oh, so great stuff. So. Yeah, we can hear you. And we can okay, good. All right. So I have two, as you can see here are the students here at Howard University listening. These are students in my introduction to women, gender, and sexualities class. And I have two students who are going to ask a live question. So Justina, do you want to come over? Oh. Hello. Um, so my question is for um, Dr. Sa um, Saidi in particular. So I'm really interested in the socio-political implications of existing outside of the gender binary. So what have you noticed about the conceptions of masculinity and femininity outside of the gender binary? And this is for people in general, but also for children coming of age specifically. Um, now things are a little, have changed, but Previously, life stage determined a whole lot. And, and to a degree, to a degree instead of gender, it was your life stage or your particular talent or the one hierarchy in Bantu societies, your age. And so motherhood was really honored, but there are a lot of institutions where men were mothers. I don't mean that in that weird way. And there are other institutions where 
biological women were considered fathers. And there's a whole lot of this idea of gender not being that important. Parenthood, motherhood, being older, grandparenthood um, makes a real difference. Interestingly, um, in Bantu societies, a lot of them, the words for children and babies before they hit puberty are the same word for biologically male and biologically female. During the reproductive period, they're much more sort of biologically marked. But as soon as you become a grandparent, you go back to the terms being one term for both grandmother and grandfather, one term for elder and things like that. So to a certain extent, um, and I know this really bothers, you know, Western feminists, but raising children was the crucial era where your biology mattered. Before and after that, it didn't. Um, so this life stage is crucial for understanding that. And the question you asked me about masculinity and femininity, if you don't have binary gender, then you don't really have it. You have things you, you know, most biologically female women would be mothers and most biologically male men would be fathers, but you could certainly change places under different institutions. And that's what makes it all so interesting, I think, because while we in the West are going, oh, what is my pronoun? Bantu languages, there is no third person singular pronoun. You just say the person. Now, that doesn't determine how they look at things, but it sure makes life a lot easier if you're not having to figure out, should I say he, should I say she, should I say they? And, um, and my point is it's much more complicated than I have time to get into and I don't wanna, with all my linguistic stuff, bore you to death. But it, it, it's really crucial to think and try and conceptualize in your head what it would be like to live in a society where there wasn't binary gender. And I guess that's what I'm proposing in some societies during some historical periods, that was true. Dr. Dawuni, we're actually gonna ask a few questions if that's okay. We'll put questions out there and then answer maybe three questions at once. If you can let us know who you're directing your question to. Thank you. Okay. okay. Hi. Hi. Um, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, my question is kind of directed towards anyone who wants to answer it, um, but it kind of comes from what Dr. Clark brought up about the harmfulness of academia, um, especially from the West. Um, as well as the larger conversation that was being had about um, the interconnectedness of theory and praxis. Um, so my question is, how do you see your work and the work of African feminist scholars continue to be cultivated at institutions like Howard or any other institution um, and with the emerging generation of feminist scholars like us and my classmates? So thank you. Great. So um, I'm gonna put a few more questions out there from the uh, Q&A chat. So Ife asks, can there be a discussion of the continued use of the term feminism as opposed to African womanism? And I think that is also related to Palumi's question about the word feminist being a Western construct. Um, so Palumi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find. Okay, um, so specifically Palumi asks, you know, did, the West not coined the term feminism. And this is directed, I think, to Dr. Dose Kuhn, but I think you know other panelists can answer, can address this too. So it's open. Um, if you're using a Western paradigm to define and describe the African women's ideology, are you not already affirming the dominance of the West over African women's identity? So that's the second question. Um, Michael had a question uh, for Dr. Magatla, that is what specific differences or difficulties do female actors, he puts in parentheses perpetrators in conflict face as opposed to male, their male counterparts and how are they being confronted? And then the final question I'm gonna add is directed to Dr. Clark from Cinderella. When discussing gender, sexuality, and spirituality, you mentioned, quote, policing women's bodies. 
I want to ask when women dress in a quote revealing way quote in ancient end quote in ancient times they are often singers or backup singers to secular musicians they perhaps they perhaps promote that genre of music with their quote sexuality I'm a bit confused about the aspect of quote ancient religion in respect to sexuality do women quote reveal their bodies in that kind of music I think we may want Cinderella to elaborate more um, on that. Um, so yes, if you all can take it away, beginning with uh, the question posed live. I'll, I'll kind of um, see if I can you know, respond a bit to it. So I think all of us have experienced racism in academia, whether as students or as faculty, as scholars, as researchers, uh, and have been kind of trained in practices that we know or we knew were um were I don't say harmful maybe a strong word uh were not compatible in our communities ways in which we were taught to engage our communities that we knew were not compatible uh and so we have had to I feel whether you kind of follow a specific methodological um, framework had to adjust based on the realities of the communities that you're engaging. I do think that the idea of activist scholars or scholar activists, you know, it's hard to be a black woman in academia and and, and write on gender and not be an activist scholar. Um, it's, it's really a difficult, I think, request. Um, so I think having to address the issues within a the academy, um, I think is important. And I think some of one of the, when you look at African feminism or some of the other terms, a lot of them kind of grew out of this reaction to not only the, the kind of broader treatment of women of African descent, but I also think the way that, Af that feminists, the Western feminists have, like someone said, kind of co-opted the term feminism or or they have kind of defined the term feminism in ways that exclude black women's experiences, ways that are not in, you know, that don't include intersectionality, that don't um see us. And so we have had to create our own terms. I will say, just kind of as a as a student coming up, and I think the Akamai are African feminist foremothers and looking at the work I was mostly influenced by, there is there is a history with Mormonism and its ties to Alice Walker. And I know that there historically has been, there have been challenges between African feminist communities and Alice Walker, um, especially, you know, her work on female genital cutting. A lot of that, there was a lot of that was really problematic. Uh, so I don't know how many of you remember that in the early nineties, a lot of the things that she wrote. There was, so there were, I don't remember the book and I have the book and I've read the book multiple times where they address Alice Walker specifically and her analysis or scholarship on African women's experiences, an analysis that clearly shows problems in, in kind of a West using a Western lens in many ways, even though um, you're creating Mormonism or coining Mormonism because you're, challenging Western terms. So I do think that there's an issue, that's been one of the issues with using womanism, why a lot of African women don't necessarily, or African feminists, and I'm not gonna speak for everyone, but that's why I specifically don't use the term womanism. Um, but I also do feel like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I do think that there are ways of using a term that exists and qualifying it. And so using African feminism or black feminism um, as a way of saying, yes, you know, the basic foundations of, you know, equal pay and all of these other things, but then we kind of have our own concerns and that need to be acknowledged and addressed and dealt with. So that's kind of, but that's my own personal. So that's not me speaking for <laughs> all African feminists or even the majority or what have you. That's Dr. Clark's perspective on it. Can I just quickly throw one thing in, which is just to add to that, I think maybe part of what the problem is, is that Western and white feminisms aren't marked. So maybe we should all be marking our feminisms and then, you know, 
not that that makes it an equal playing field, but you know, because obviously we say feminism and then we say black feminism and African feminism and so on. And really, I think the, the expectation that African women must have their own term, an expectation that, uh, you know, people place only on African women, you know, we don't ask that of African men who call themselves radical Marxists. We have some of those in South Africa. Um, and these uh, decolonial scholars, many of, of whom are simply regurgitating ideas from Latin American scholars white Latin American scholars, and yet they call themselves decolonial scholars, and yet we will challenge and dismiss African women for calling themselves African feminists as if ideas don't evolve. Um, and so that's my response to that. I had wanted to also respond to the question of gender fluidity that was raised to Professor Saidi earlier. So we published a, a, a special issue on the 30th anniversary of if you are my, Professor If you are my Dume's book, 30 um, Male Daughters, Female Husbands, last year. And one of the examples that we use are, um, to show the resilience of these histories of fluidity in South Africa um, is an example of the Mandela family. So when um, there's this case between Mandela Mandela, who's the grandchild of Mandela, and Madiba's eldest child and daughter, Makaziwe Mandela where the nephew moves a number of family graves without seeking the permission of family members, and more so the sister who is the most senior person of Man Man Mandela's uh, children that are alive. And there the patriarchs in South Africa said, well, Makaziwe Mandela is now married to a man in Ghana. She does not have the room to claim a role in the Mandela or the Tembu household. And it was the work of African feminists to say, in cultural terms, if we understand the history of how seniority works, Makaziwa Mandela is Mandela Mandela's father. That is what Nobuzolo Mdende said. If we recognize the fact that we don't have the baggage of his pronouns in Isikosa, Makaziwe is Mandela Mandela's father. This happens again when Matikizala Mandela, when Matikizala Mandela passes away. Her nephew says to the world, when people said that she was left by a man, divorced by Mandela, we in the Matigizela household were celebrating because we had gained a father. He says this in Isikos, Safu Manutata, we had gained a father. And for an Isikos speaker, you don't have to bend your mind to imagine what that means, because he was talking about the authority that she held in the household. But we do ask the question, what would have happened? What would have been her authority if her brother was still alive? So we take seriously Zengu's critique of Amaidume's work. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about that. Then there was actually, the- I, I just want, sorry. can I respond real quickly? I just want to say, actually in the book we're writing, we use that quote about Winnie Mandela, cause it's, you know, and you're right. Um, I mean, the difference probably is between a matrilineal societies and patrilineal and to who's the authority figure. But anyway, thanks, so thanks. another debate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But thank you. Yeah, that, was a, that was an amazing um, publication. I learned a lot thanks. from it. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, I wanted to respond to the, the question around, you know, links between, I guess, African feminists and feminists in the diaspora you know, such as feminists at Howard, you know, one of the things that inspired me as an undergraduate student was to read Bell Hook's work where she was making connections between women in Kentucky, black women in Kentucky and women living in apartheid South Africa. And Patricia Hill Collins in Black Feminist Thought makes a potent intervention in a South African debate about motherism. You know, she draws from an African-American uh, experience but responds to the key debates in South Africa, taking South African scholars seriously. I think one of the ways in which we, you know, we, we um, keep these connections is to take each other's work seriously. Often it is the case that African, us in Africa, we are citing African-American feminists and there's no reciprocity. Um, reciprocity. But when there is, it, it can only benefit our theorization. And the last question was around, you know, women and conflict. Um, uh, you know, I tried to respond to this, um, in the chapter, um, and it is, of course, you know, women and, and boys and girls are abducted, 
But of course, women and girls face a higher risk of uh, sexual violence. You know, this is a known fact. And they also face a higher risk of being ostracized for their combat role after the war. I'll stop there. Did anyone else want to address any of the other questions? All right, I think we have time for one more question um, because we, we know folks have to get to class. It's been a very rich discussion. Um, so I think we're gonna go to, there are so many great questions here. Um, O.M. Olanian asks, um, it seems that there's been a general move away from essentialism, which I think is a recurring theme that came out in each of your chapters towards quote, practical theory as Dr. Dose Kuhn notes. I'm very interested in how essentialism enables African feminists, especially queer or LGBT feminists to at once make a claim, even though, even though those essentialisms are fraught and problematic. So how are they using African essentialism? Are there ways that you all, all the panelists see essentialism continuing to be useful or essentialism springing anew? If I can give a quick response, I mean, I'm not sure if this is quite what the question is asking, but um, certainly in practice and certainly in the literature that I reviewed in the chapter, essentialisms are being mobilized uh, for the most, well, essentialisms, essentialisms get mobilized against African feminisms, but I guess part of what I was saying is also that certain essentialist claims get made within African feminist literatures as well, but typically not in favor, for example, of queer uh, Africans, you know, quite the contrary. Um, you know, it, it tends to be the kind of discourse of this uh, queer subjectivity and queer practices and so on are un-African, you know, that is the more kind of dominant discourse. And then the, the responses that we see to that are precisely historicizing responses, saying and trying to show and trying to argue that actually that, you know, that these claims are not true and that there are long histories of different kinds of practices in, in the African context. I'd just like to say, if there wasn't binary gender, then this whole question is moot. Because, you know, you have this kind of fluidity that, you know, I, I, I don't know, I think, I think we too much, as, as a Westerner and all, too much categorize everything into these neat little boxes. And I think, Maybe we need to sort of relax a little and look at historically these roles that people played. Thank you. So as a closing question, um, very briefly, if you can share any current projects that you're working on now or areas of further research for the graduate students who are on the Zoom today. Um, I'm writing a book with my colleagues called um, family before gender. And we're looking at this, at least for the last 3,000 years, the role of family instead of gender and hierarchy and other issues. Um, we're really trying to look at a whole different approach to studying early African history, and especially Bantu-speaking Africa. So it's family before gender. <laughs> It's got a whole long other title. I've forgotten it though. Hopefully it'll be out next. Okay. Dr. Dosekun? Yeah, thank you. Well, not to uh, further complicate the question of what is feminism and which feminisms and so on, but you know, my my recently completed uh, monograph is on post-feminism in the African context. So, you know, another sort of instant, another variation, I suppose. But my next project, which I'm, I'm gonna be in Nigeria for field work later in the year, my next project is looking at what in the West has been referred to as neoliberal feminism, but you know, so this is very much uh, kind of pro-business entrepreneurial uh, type feminism in the Nigerian context. And I'm looking at it as it intersects with Christian evangelicism. Oh, I will be looking at it. Exciting work. Dr. Magatla? I'm currently working on revisions on my manuscript on women and the armed struggle in South Africa based on my PhD work. And then finally, Dr. Kapona Carr. Um, well, I have a 
an edited book coming out with Dr. Wumpini Mohammed um, titled African Women in Digital Spaces, Redefining Social Movements on the Continent and in the Diaspora. And it's coming out with, um, we decided to go with an African press. So um, Mkuki Nanyota Publishers out of Tanzania. And um, yeah, so that should hopefully be out soon. Hopefully we have, we've been working on it, it seems like forever. But as you know, edited volumes <laughs> are not, not easy. So, absolutely. Thank you so much. So, in terms of the the ongoing labor of decolonizing, you know, feminist scholarship, African feminist scholarship, you all are continuing that. Again, the title of the book is the Paul Grave Handbook of African Women's Studies. Please download it. Ask your library to buy the book. <laughs> so, if you're from an, another institution, please ask your library to buy the book. I want to thank each of the speakers um, for sharing your work. Um, it was truly an enlightening discussion. I want to thank the editors of the book, Drs. Yakub Haliso and Dr. Uh, Falola. And we want to thank Fozia Farah of the Center of for African and the Center for African Studies, the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership for hosting this event. Um, a special thanks to the hardworking team of faculty, staff, and students that work for the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. If you're interested in learning more, please visit our website. Um, please attend our events. This month is International Women's History Month. All right, thank you so much again for joining us and we look forward to reading more of your work in the future. Thank you. And thank you for the expert moderation. <laughs> yes, thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs>